the silent intelligence. All right, good evening. And welcome to yet another silent intelligence event. Um, my name is Daniel Obodovsky, and I'm the founder of the Silent Intelligence. Uh, Silent Intelligence essentially is a strategy consulting company. We work with tech companies and help them grow and be successful. Um, the thing about strategy, it always requires thinking outside of the box. And that's one of the reasons why we put together these events. The events that introduce interesting people, we bring um, great speakers, uh, we facilitate interesting discussions, and uh, very importantly, we also bring interesting people in the audience. If you haven't met them yet, maybe you'll have after the event to meet some of them. Um, and it's always great to see everybody. Uh, so basically, um, even though we're primarily about the Internet of Things and uh, what we do, we're always trying to look outside of the most typical things, like the outside of technology and so on, and talk about um, things like healthcare or things like connected cities and specifically today we're going to talk about brain and brain science and also technology and how it relates to the brain. Um, so if you haven't joined our meetup just yet, please do it. It's the Silent Intelligence Meetup San Diego. Uh, and that way you'll always know which events are coming up and you're always going to be uh, aware what, what other exciting things we're doing. Uh, also, feel free to spread the word and tell others about uh, what we're doing. Um, at this stage, I wanted to talk a little bit about those without whom this event would not be possible, and those are our sponsors. And first and foremost, this is uh, Wolfpack Ventures, Wolf, who is right there, and uh, who offered us this location. <laughs> Let me say a couple of things about this location, so what you're seeing today uh, is it's going to be very, very different soon. It's going to become a shared space, downtown San Diego. And uh, we are very lucky to have this. Uh, it's called Downtown Works. And we are very lucky to have our events here. So we're going to have uh, our events here more regularly. Uh, and um, do you guys like the space? Yeah. I think it's fantastic, isn't it? Thanks, Wolf. Well, just imagine what it can become. There are some, uh, actually, some posters that you can see uh, in the hall, what, what it might look like in, in a few months from now, right? All right, so the also, uh, did you guys like the beer? Yes. yes, all right. So that's Nova Brazil and Chula Vista who are sponsoring us for beer. Great. So actually, now it's time to jump straight into what we're going to be talking about tonight. And uh, we're very lucky to have Brad Wojtek joining us. Brad is actually very hard to get, I can tell you this, because he travels around the world and speaks at different conferences. He spoke at TED twice, and last year he spoke at TEDx San Diego. He is also a professor of uh, cognitive and computational sciences at uh, UCSD. Um, <laughs> uh, he um, um, author of a very popular blog and recently published a book which called Do Zombies Dream of Undead Sheep? Uh, which we may talk a little bit more today. So, um, welcome. Oh, and one thing I forgot to mention, he's also been advisor to Uber, which we definitely want to learn more about it. So the words going around today, I'm going to ask Brad a few questions for the first maybe 30 minutes, and then we're going to open it up to all of you. Please, whatever uh, you uh, uh, wanted to know and wanted to ask Brad. Uh, please, please ask. Welcome, Brad. Thank you, Daniel. So, it kind of lets me uh, jump straight into uh, some of the things that you're working on. And one of the most intriguing things for me is your relationship with Uber. I mean, when I think about cognitive scientists, um, the connection to Uber doesn't come immediately to mind. So can you tell a little bit more what's, what you've been doing for Uber and uh, what you've uh, learned? Okay, so to put it out there, I'm no longer affiliated with Uber. Uh, I started working with Uber in February of 2011. Uh, so at that time, Uber was uh, uh, 10 people in a co-working space with like 20 other companies trying to get started. Um, and actually, Uber has a very deep San Diego connection. So the first CEO of Uber, Travis Graves, is a San Diego native, and he got the job from a tweet. 
uh, actually. So the current CEO, Travis Kalanick, had actually sent out a tweet. He was a co-founder of Uber, saying that he needed somebody who could run this new startup. And this guy, Tra uh, Ryan Graves, uh, responded and said, hey, hit me up. And so Graves became the first CEO of Uber. He is now the VP of something or other at Uber. He's been there f very early on. I got pulled into Uber, actually. I had just finished my PhD in, uh, so I did my PhD in neuroscience at Berkeley. And uh, my wife was pregnant with her first child. And academia is wonderful, but it doesn't pay very well. <coughs> and I wasn't, I didn't know what I wanted to be doing for certain. So I, I really enjoy neuroscience research, but I wasn't positive that that's where I wanted to stay. Uh, I, I like to, I guess, run behavioral experiments on myself. I like to sort of push myself outside of what I'm normally doing to see if I go back. And if I do go back, then great, then I'm gonna keep doing that. And if I don't, then that's great, I have a new path. Um, and a very good friend of mine, uh, one of my closest and oldest friends, actually, I grew up in San Diego for a few years off and on. Uh, my friend Curtis Chambers had just started working for Uber uh, a few months prior. Uh, and he, was, he was, was, at the time, the head of engineering. I think he still is something equivalent of that. Uh, I believe he's running now Uber Eats, which is their new attempt at trying to get on-demand food delivery. He was like, hey, we really need somebody who knows how to do something with data analysis uh, for this uh, on-demand car startup I'm working for. And I'm like, what? <laughs> well, uh, you, know, you know what I do, right? Like I study neuroscience, so how does that relate? And he's like, we just need somebody who knows how to do something with data. Um, and so I talked back and forth with my, with my wife and I, when I told my colleagues, they thought it was the dumbest thing I'd ever heard. Uh, and I'm like, no, I think this idea really actually has legs, <laughs> which, you know, <laughs> Uh, five years later and $70 billion in valuation later, uh, it turns out probably did have legs. Um, but, uh, you know, my wife was pregnant, we, we, and so I, I, I was going to begin my postdoctoral research fellowship. So for those that don't know the academic sort of march, the latter, you do your PhD, and then often in uh, sciences and STEM, you do what's called a postdoctoral fellowship, where you work in a lab, but kind of running your own lab within a lab. And that's usually anywhere from two to five years. And then you try and become a professor. And so I delayed the start of my postdoctoral fellowship to go work for Uber for six months. And again, it was just like six of us hanging out in this co-working, or 10 of us or whatever it was, hanging out in this co-working space. And uh, I sat down for dinner with, uh, or lunch I should say, with my friend Curtis and the CEO, uh, Travis. And you know they wanted to do like whiteboarding problems or all the rage, right, for, uh, tech jobs in the Bay Area where they try and give you some sort of programming challenge and you solve you know, esoteric equations and questions and stuff. And I said, how about you just give me some of your data and if I don't do something interesting by the end of the day, we just shake hands and call it. And he said, okay, let's do that. And so I, they gave me some of their data to play with and I, I, I did some analyses for them and uh, they hired me. And I worked for them full time for six months until my son was born. And uh, then I was gonna quit and go back to academia, which I did, but uh, that was a hard decision because they offered me a lot more money and a lot more stock. But even though I valued the stock at a very high thing and said, okay, you know, even if it goes to this, like what if it becomes Google-like? It, it really wasn't what I wanted to be doing. It wasn't where my heart was, right? Like there's a certain amount of money. I, I don't come from a well-off background. So even at like $45,000 a year as a postdoc, I was still making more than my family had really, uh, and I have a friend of the family here who knows that quite well. <laughs> and so it, like there was no multiplier of that that would make much of a difference at that point. And so uh, I went back to doing what I really, really enjoyed doing, which is neuroscience, but it really came down to data and data analysis. So what are the th some of the things that you learned uh, with your data analytics with Uber that uh, is helping you with uh, uh, neuroscience and cognitive science? Data can help you solve a lot of problems uh, if you don't really care why, <laughs> right? So the, my favorite example, I teach a data science class now at UCSD, and one of my favorite examples is up until their redesign and rebranding, Google's homepage, www.google.com, uh, their logo rarely ever changed. And their logo iteration number 11 happened about a year ago. And what they had changed between iteration 10 and 11 was they had moved the L in Google over and down by one pixel. People are like, 
why did they do that? Like, why did it take a year and a half or two years to make that decision? Why did they do that? I am positive now that there is some, we say A-B testing, right, in, in industry, right? Like they just had served different versions of that landing page to some subset of people and some some metric worked better, some KPI, right? Um, key performance index probably came out better. And so it didn't matter why, who knows why, let's just do it. And it's actually interesting being a cognitive science department because uh, one big thing is also why, right? Like so in, in at UCSD, um, the founding member of the Department of Cognitive Science, his name is Don Norman. And he was a professor at UCSD for a very long time. He founded Cognitive Science. And then in 1993, he left Cognitive Science in UCSD to go work for a small company called Apple. <laughs> and he was a VP of uh, uh, something or other design. I don't want to get it wrong, but he worked at Apple for about 20 years, up until about a year or two ago. And then he, after, I, I presume, he made a decent amount of money, came back to UCSD and he started with uh, Professor Scott Klemmer, uh, the design institute, the design lab, the D-Lab. And they're all about data-driven, but with cognitive principles, how do you make design? And, and Don Norman has written a great book called The Design of Everyday Things. That's one of my favorite books, and it's actually uh, uh, quoted it heavily when I was writing uh, my book, The Salad <laughs> Intelligence. Yeah, yeah, and so, so there's sort of this nice, I, I, at least I felt at the time when I was working at Uber especially, there's sort of this nice marriage of, okay, let's, let's use data, but also let's actually take some things that we know about how people behave and see if we can, we can make make the data-driven decisions better. There's actually a really good uh, short, a very short piece uh, by O'Reilly Publishing Group uh, written by Hillary Mason. Uh, she's a data scientist formerly at Bitly. She's now a uh, data scientist in residence at a VC, I forget whose name, and also uh, DJ Patel. Uh, he is now the chief data scientist for the White House uh, and the deputy chief technology officer for the White House. Uh, he used to be the former head of data science at LinkedIn. Uh, really nice, really great guy. And they had written this very short piece called data, uh, uh, something along the lines of uh, data-driven culture or how to, how to create a data-driven data culture. And it's for companies of what, why would a company want to use data and how do, how do you actually create a good data-driven company uh, from the ground up? And that was one of the things that really helped Uber a lot was from day one they said, how can we use the data that we're collecting to make the system better, right? Because ultimately your goal is to get a car faster and based upon how people behave and you know when things happen and how things happen, you can make pretty strong predictions. So let's go um, from there a little bit more to the uh, brain science. And how can you use those vast amounts of data to actually determine either certain patterns inside of the brain, maybe some abnormalities or potentially disorders and so on and so on. So I'm sort of breaking my own rule here because normally I don't talk about my research that hasn't been peer reviewed uh, because I, I respect the peer review process. Uh, however, for a small group here, uh, I'll go ahead and just sort of talk about some of the stuff. So uh, neuroscience is big. I just got back from, the reason I wasn't at uh, TEDx San Diego last week was uh, there was the annual Society for Neuroscience Conference, which is 35, thousand neuroscientists from around the world meet for a week every year. Uh, and if you ever did like a high school science fair where you have the poster and you set it up and it's like, you know, can I run a clock or, you know, can I use a potato like a battery or something like that? It's a lot like that, except it cost several billion dollars of NIH money to get all of those posters there. And it's thousands and thousands of these research posters from people all around the world talking about the latest and greatest neuroscience research. And Every month, there's something on the order of 30,000 peer-reviewed neuroscience publications published every month. So as a neuroscientist, if I want to try and stay on top of the peer-reviewed literature, I cannot. It's impossible. There's something like 3 million that have been published in the past. So if I am a, I, I run a lab at UCSD, I've got five PhD students. When they join the lab, what am I supposed to do? Oh, here's 3 million peer-reviewed facts you have to catch up on, right? You can't do it. Uh, and so my wife and I had actually designed, we, we were in this project where we said, okay, let's take this very simple idea. Let's scrape data from all three million of these papers and say, if a lot of papers talk about Alzheimer's and memory together, then Alzheimer's and memory are probably related. And let's just do that for a thousand neuroscientific brain region names, diseases, neurotransmitters, drugs. Let's just throw everything in there scrape through and find all these relationships and see what comes out. 
And uh, so it worked. I mean, you, we, we did this data mining project and we found that Alzheimer's gets, you know, you can run clustering algorithms and all this kind of stuff. So you get these nice clusters of Alzheimer's and memory and the hippocampus, which is a brain region important for memory. All of these things sort of cluster together and you just algorithmically, you can just pull out relationships between topics. But then we sort of took it a next step further and said, well, okay, well, what do we do with this information? And so we essentially took uh, Facebook's friend recommendation algorithm and it says, if you and I are friends on Facebook and you and I are friends on Facebook, maybe you two should be friends. And if you're not, then Facebook says, hey, maybe you know this person. Same exact idea. So if the region, brain region of the striatum has six or 7,000 papers published on that brain region also uh, talking about uh, migraines. And migraines are also very strongly related to serotonin many thousands of peer-reviewed papers talking about serotonin, which is a neurotransmitter. But there's only seven papers talking about the brain region of striatum and migraines. So maybe migraines and striatum should be a friend. It's very simple. It's just like the simple friend re recommendation algorithm. And so this got me into the idea of uh, automated hypothesis generation. Right? When you're a new PhD student starting a lab and you're trying to find a research project, you start seeing what other people have done. But that's still laborious and it's still prone to your limitations as a person of reading through these papers. What if we could kind of automate that process a little bit? And so that's already been published. We did that a couple years ago. And we've taken that a next step further and said, okay, well, what else can we do? So Paul Allen, who is one of the co-founders of Microsoft, has sunk about a billion dollars of his own private money uh, to create an organization in Seattle called the Allen Brain Institute. And the Allen Brain Institute has hundreds of neuroscientists, hundreds of PhDs. And what they're doing is they're mapping out in the brain, in human brains, uh, where different genes are expressed. So you have 20, 30,000 genes that they're looking at, all of these different genes. And they say, okay, let's take a slice of brain and sample this entire slice of brain and say, what, where are these different 30,000 genes expressed? And you can find that genes that encode for uh, uh, dopamine transporters, which is you know this neurotransmitter for related to reward, uh, they have an expression in these particular places. So we take that brain map of where these things are, are located, uh, these genes are expressed, and we have this database from a colleague of mine, Tali Arconi, who also did a data mining project, which is, uh, are people familiar with brain imaging, fMRI, functional magnetic brain scans, right? Functional magnetic resonance imaging. There's tens of thousands of papers published on brain scans. He scraped all of those and said, in this paper, where are the XYZ 3D coordinates uh, in the brain that are active in this paper? And what words are used in this paper? And if the word attention appears 1% of the time, or if the word memory appears 2% of the time, that 3D coordinate XYZ 3D place in the brain, we're gonna give it a weight of attention by 2%. And we'll do that for all of the papers. And what he did is, but in doing this, he took these 10,000 papers, and you can just algorithmically come up with, here's a map of where in the brain we think a memory happens, or where in the brain uh, learning happens. And what was amazing was, when he actually did brain scans on people and gave them a study, he could take their brain maps and kick it back into this algorithm and say, based upon this pattern of activity, what do you, the algorithm, think the person is doing? And it got every single one right, except for one or two people, where it said, uh, they're asleep. This is related to sleeping. And he's like, that's not right. They were supposed to be doing an attention task. And then he actually went back and asked those people, and guess what? They'd fallen asleep in the brain scanner. And so he has this, now we have, a, we have a way of taking these 3D maps of where in the brain different topics are related, as well as where in the brain different genes are expressed. And so now we can mash those two together, which is what my lab is working on, one project, and saying, take all of the brain regions involved in memory. What genes of these 20,000 genes are over or under expressed uh, in these memory related regions of the brain? Because in genetic studies, we have, we have a couple of genes that we like everybody's excited about, because they're the ones that really strongly relate to certain things. But what about all these other ones that we don't know anything about? And so maybe this is a way of identifying genes that should be or are related to these different kinds of ideas like Alzheimer's or memory or attention or what have you that we're missing. So maybe we can use these data-driven uh, decisions to help actually generate novel hypotheses. So let me ask you this. I mean, and when you and I spoke last time on Monday, um, the conversation went around different disorders like depression, uh, Alzheimer's, um, uh, different personality disorders and so on and so on. And today, a lot of them being diagnosed in kind of a subjective way. So you go through interviewing and, you know, and somebody detects whether you might have a depression or not, or you have like 
borderline personality disorder, something like this. Do you think what data can help us uh, in, in understanding of the brain to be a lot more scientific about that? Oh and God, be able to, so. <laughs> <laughs> and being able to pinpoint, okay, when you measured certain things, you can, okay, the pers this person definitely has a, dep a depression right now, or that person is having something else. I mean, do people know about this? We don't really actually have biological definitions for things like depression. Uh, so there's a thing, we, we call it the, the psychiatric Bible in the United States. It's called the DSM. It's currently on iteration five. It's actually DSM five, but it's iteration like eight, because they had like three A and B and C, whatever, it doesn't matter. So we have this Bible, and that is a thing that defines different disorders. So DSM-1, for example, had homosexuality as a psychiatric disorder. That's not in there anymore, thankfully. But so it, it suggests right from the beginning that, well, you know, maybe this isn't really biologically driven. Maybe there's some cultural aspect of this, right? Um, that's the first warning sign. The second is that these disorders are, are, are characterized. They, the way that they define them is, like, if in order to be classified as having schizophrenia, a psychiatrist says, you have to have, the, the DSM says, you have to have exhibited three of these seven symptoms within the last six months. And there's actually somebody that took all of these symptoms from the DSM, uh, uh, essentially a data scientist, and they said, how unique are these clusters of symptoms? And it turns out that there are many, many clusters of symptoms where if you have, uh, you know, you heard a voice within the last six months and you've had like, you know, um, uh, motivation problems and attention problems. You could technically fall under one of seven disorders that are wildly different in terms of what we think biologically is happening. Uh, and so that was a really interesting approach that somebody took and just said, well, let's just take the DSM and say, how do they define these things? Oh, there are not unique definitions for these disorders. Right? So that's, that's the first approach of just using data to say, how are we identifying these things in the first place? Um, the, the next harder one is how do you come up with, is there a biological definition? Is there such a thing as, is there like a, a, a unifying thing as depression? Or are there many different flavors? Is it culturally, culturally dependent? There's a really fascinating book. I can't really endorse this scientifically uh, because I don't really know if there's any scientific validity to it, meaning it's not invalid, but it hasn't been proved. Uh, but it's called Crazy Like Us. And the author goes through these different, I give different sort of historical contexts and says, uh, the one example I remember is early on in the book, he talks about uh, anorexia. Did not exist in Hong Kong up until like 1987 or nine, or I forget the exact date, but there's like somewhere in the 80s and early 90s, suddenly anorexia became a thing that existed in Hong Kong. And what had happened was there was a girl who died from, uh, she hadn't been eating. And the media in Hong Kong picked this up as anorexia is a Western disease. And it got all over the media. And like suddenly anorexia became a thing that people knew about. And suddenly lots and lots of people started showing signs of anorexia. And so the argument in this book is that there are underlying pathologies that are neural. There are brain pathologies. How they express themselves is culturally dependent. And that's a fascinating idea. And I have no idea how to actually go about testing something like that because you can't do an experiment on, well, let's have you in a different culture and see what happens, right? But it's a really fascinating idea that you can have. I mean, and it kind of makes sense in terms of what we know, or at least apocryphally from like uh, indigenous cultures, right? Where instead of being schizophrenic, they may have been a shaman or something like that, right? So the way that we define these kinds of behaviors is culturally dependent. Like if I, it turns out something like 20% of the US population has heard a voice at some point in their life. And if you grow up in a culture where hearing voices is something magical and amazing, then that's not gonna stress you out. But if you grow up in a culture where hearing voices means you're crazy, and that means you're schizophrenic and schizophrenia is bad, then that might actually make you, that might be very anxiety inducing. And so it might sort of self-propagate, right? So it makes sense on an intuitive level. And we've argued in a couple of, uh, and I could talk about this because it is peer reviewed papers that uh, learning, how you learn is based upon, uh, we say connections weights in the brain. So as you do something more and more and more, the neurons involved in that process, they, they strengthen, they, they sort of reinforce one another. And so that brain circuit is easier to activate. And so we've argued that something like depression, I don't know if anybody's experienced any kind of actual, like not just a sad, sad day, but like a depressive episode or an anxiety episode. What happens is you ruminate on that. You wake up and that's the first thing you're thinking about in the morning. Am I gonna have a panic attack again today? 
And that rumination, which what is what is called in psychiatry, you are reinforcing that circuit, so it becomes easier and easier to happen. And there's actually a whole there's a wonderful uh, colleague of mine. Her name is Kelly Clancy, and she's written this piece. She actually just started writing for the New Yorker, talking about unlearning brain disorders. You learn, she's saying, you learn brain disorders by having these kind of reinforced thoughts that strengthen those neural networks. Can you train yourself to not have those thoughts, which is essentially what cognitive behavioral therapy is. So that's actually a, that's fascinating. By the way, I'm, I'm I just f I find all those uh, things that put in perspective of what we consider. Some people consider disorders that others may not consider disorders. But actually, in this point, I wanted to go from detection or diagnostics to healing, as you already started talking about that. And um, we know today a lot of those uh, uh, disorders uh, treated with pharmaceuticals, right? Then the um, now, you mentioned this thing, what's called electroceuticals, which I think is very interesting. And also, what other ways, if you put the pharmaceutical aside, what other ways to heal people uh, using technology? So neuroscience is kind of a funny field, right? Because uh, like ideally, what you want to do is try and help people, right? Uh, and early on in my career, I thought, okay, maybe I'll become a medical doctor. Right? And I know if I'm a medical doctor, I know I'm helping people on an everyday basis. Right? At least like I go to work, and you know that you're helping people. Right? And that's very appealing. Uh, research is weird because you can potentially, in a 50-year career, if you find one thing, you might be able to help a million people or a billion people. Or you could just spend that 50 years and do come up with nothing. Right? It's a fun job. Right? So... <laughs> Um, I enjoy it, but it, it, so so that's like the starting point of like why do we why do we study the brain? I started out as a physicist, right? like I initially as an undergraduate was studying physics, and I wanted to know like all about the the universe and like how are we here, uh, and think, uh, ultimately though that doesn't really matter because a lot of the way that we come up with that reduces to how we think, uh, and so that that was sort of the path of how I got into neuroscience, and as I've gone along in my career, you look at the the pharmaceutical revolution of the 60s and 70s. And that was amazing, right? We suddenly had a pill that you could take that would help people. Uh, and that's, that's, that's incredible. So you look at something like depression, affects millions of Americans, and you could take a pill every day and help them out. Except weirdly, these kinds of things are becoming less effective over time. Right, over the last couple of decades, the efficacy of pharmaceuticals and the efficacy of treatment has been decreasing for some reason, and we don't really know why. And I've argued in, in my research that what are, so in depression, selective, serotonin, selective serotonergic reuptake inhibitors. That is, that is the primary, SSRIs is one of the primary drugs that are used. And what that does is they block the reuptake of serotonin, which is a neurotransmitter. Uh, reuptake is you have a neuron and it sends out a neurotransmitter into the synapse, which is the space between neurons. And the neuron that is connected to or close to that the serotonin neurotransmitter molecules bind to that next neuron and cause that next neuron to do something. And uh, it's thought that, okay, well, these SSRIs, which we don't know why they work, it's just a pharmaceutical that does work. Uh, it blocks serotonin from getting removed from that synapse, the one that's not used, so it increases the amount of serotonin available to the next neurons. We don't know why it works. A lot of things we don't know why they work. Penicillin, we don't even know why it works. It worked. Let's use it. Um, but I've argued that what is the ultimate effect of any of these neurotransmitters? So do people know neurons, the brain cells in your brain, the way that they work is they communicate electrically. They send these electrical impulses, and an impulse goes, and you have one neuron here, and it sends an impulse down the wire, the axon, and that electrical impulse, when it gets to the end of that wire, causes neurotransmitter to be released into the synapse, and those neurotransmitters bind to the next neuron, which creates a change in the charge, the electrical charge of that next neuron, and if it builds up, then it sends another action potential, that next neuron, and so on and so forth. So any drug, dopamine drugs like cocaine, which is also, a, a, I think, a reuptake inhibitor for dopamine, uh, serotonin, all of these drugs, ultimately their effect in the brain is changing the way that the electrical signaling happens between neurons. But they're not precise. This is a major problem for all drugs. You have serotonin receptors in your stomach. You have serotonin receptors all over your body. This is why you have side effects. This is why antidepressants and all these kinds of things cause you know, problems in, like, 
uh, you know, uh, you can have nausea, you can, you can have gastrointestinal issues, you can have, uh, you know, sexual drive issues because they're not just working on the central nervous system. We're not just brains in jars. Our bodies are also physically connected and they play a major role in everything, right? And so we've argued uh, that electroceuticals are a way of bypassing some of that. Instead of giving a drug that washes all over the body and has effects God knows where and how it works, we don't know. Let's take what we know about some of the brain circuitry abnormalities and let's see if we can target those with electrically. So uh, ideally you have an implanted device in the exact brain region where there is a, a communication disorder. So for example, in a rumination disorder like uh, depression, what we've argued is uh, there's a, a technology called deep brain stimulation that is very effective for Parkinson's disease. And we'll play a video of uh, somebody with this a little bit later. Parkinson's disease is unique in that it's one of the th few things that we know where in the brain is something gone wrong. Very specific neurons in a very specific brain region have died off. We don't know why, but we know those are the ones that are gone. And so what they do is they implant this electrode forever. It's always in you. And you have a battery pack and a dial on your chest that's implanted. And you can turn that dial and you can increase or decrease the amount of stimulation. And you go from not being able to walk or move to just being able to move just fine. And it works for depression too, a little bit, not as effective. There's a different brain region. They, they install this thing and they stimulate. And you see somebody for whom it works in the operating room. They're awake during these surgeries. They turn that thing on and they just go, I feel like for the first time a cloud is lifted. Like I, I suddenly feel like myself again after having severe depression for like 15 years. But that's really invasive, right? And we yeah, don't and know how it works. And you know, to be honest, it kind of freaks me out um, when I think about uh, you know drilling holes in my head and putting things inside it. And I know maybe that's the way we're, we're all going and maybe they'll all become, you know, you can maybe inject them at some point of time. But still, kind of this whole idea of uh, putting electronics in, inside my body, mm, I don't know. But uh, let me ask you this, what about things like meditation. And, and, and you and I talked a little bit about uh, exercise, like physical exercise and also exercise for the brain and using some kind of a technology to help you stay, stay on top of it, right? I, maybe it's not as easy as taking a pill, but apparently it's more effective. Can you talk a little bit more about that? So one of the only things that we know actually peer-reviewed, easily re replicatable, one of the only things we know that actually staves off like cognitive decline with aging is exercise. That's it. Like there's a lot of conjecture. There's all these other kinds of things. We don't really know. The jury's still out. Does red meat cause cancer? Does it not cause cancer? Should I eat eggs because cholesterol is good? Should I eat eggs because cholesterol is bad? I don't know anymore. Exercise is legitimately proved to be one of the few things that actually helps depression, anxiety, age-related cognitive decline. We know that these things are true. It's one of the few things. I have a very good colleague, actually, uh, uh, funny, my co-author of the Stupid Zombie book, uh, which is actually lovely. I shouldn't call it stupid, <laughs> but it's very goofy. Um, but my, my friend Tim Versainen, he's now a professor at Carnegie Mellon, and he actually studies the effects of exercise on cognitive functioning. And it's like, repeatedly, you can see that this is true. Um, meditation is a little bit more difficult because the definition of meditation and how do you quantify it is really hard. Uh, I did my postdoctoral research with a, a, a professor up at UC San Francisco named Adam Gasly, um, who's also given a number of uh, very interesting TED Talks. And he actually studies age-related cognitive decline. And he's actually very close to getting FDA approval for a brain training game for staving off cognitive decline. Uh, they have a paper that they published in the journal Nature about a year and a half ago showing how um, playing a, a video game that they, they developed uh, very specifically to help train uh, attention, uh, help stave off age-related uh, decline in attention and things like that. But there's a, another researcher in that lab. His name is David Ziegler. He's a postdoctoral researcher uh, initially from MIT. He's now at uh, UCSF. And he's actually come up with a very clever app and uh, study for how do you uh, train people on meditating. Uh, so it's actually training people how to meditate better. And they're looking at that right now. Um, and that took a long time for him to try and figure this out. Um, but really, the, the argument that we've made in, the, in this one paper is, uh, like, how, do these thing, how does something like meditation work? Would be, uh, again, we argue that it's essentially, um, you have this rumination circuit. We can actually sort of talk about these brain regions that are hyper-connected in anxiety, for example. 
and something like cognitive behavioral therapy, which is very effective uh, for depression and anxiety, essentially boils down to if you're having depressive or an anxious thoughts, try and think of something different. I mean, it's more subtle than that and it's harder than that, but that's essentially the gist. And what we're arguing is things like that are, try are training you to unlearn uh, a habit. It's, it's essentially unlearning a habit. Like, um, I wake up in the morning, am I gonna have a panic attack today? Actually, let me think about something else instead. Just reminding yourself, like a string on a finger, you know, oh, don't do that. Don't, don't, don't focus on that, which seems totally ridiculous. And I actually gave a talk at, um, uh, uh, oh geez, uh, Del Mar High? No. Crap, I'm totally forgetting. Anyway, uh, yeah, may, I think it was Delmar High. Uh, it was like 3,000 high school students, and I was talking about this, and I was talking about the brain surgeries, and I said, who here in the audience, because there's a lot of high school students in a very wealthy neighborhood that are really stressed out by your parents and like having to succeed, who here does the idea that you can inject a thing into your brain that stimulates part of your brain or you can like unlearn something by thinking about something else, does that feel fake or does that even make you more anxious by thinking that, like, in order to solve this, I have to electrically simulate. And there's, like, a ton of hands shot up. It's, like, it makes people very uncomfortable. Um, but really, it's, like, it works. It's been shown, like, even in psychology studies. If you just tell people, smile. You just smile. Just smile more. They're, like, that's, I'm not going to smile more. That's so fake. It's it really, like, your brain is kind of a fake it till you make it. They end up, six months later, feeling happier overall. And they forget that they have to, like, f fake smile all the time. So this weird relationship between just doing something habitually, even if it feels fake initially, can have a major, major outcome in your behavior and in, in, in the brain. Very cool. Uh, before we going to open it to uh, all your questions, uh, I wanted to ask you this. As we're approaching Halloween, I thought we would be unfair not to talk about zombies. And um, I wanted to ask you, uh, what, are what is zombie brain, and what's, uh, why are you so interested in it? <laughs> if I go into a classroom at a high school, and I start talking about the role that neural oscillations play in coordinating information transfer between brain regions by spike timing dependent plasticity, they don't care. <laughs> it doesn't make any sense to them. If I go into a high school, and I start talking about the reason that zombies are slow, and lurching is because of a cerebellar deficit and that fast zombies remain fast because the cerebellum and the basal ganglia remain intact and the basal ganglia are more for coordinating movement uh, for uh, uh, the cerebellum is more for coordinating movements and the basal ganglia is more through habitual movements. Suddenly high school students are like asking me questions and arguing about what like why cerebellum versus basal ganglia and like it, it actually engages them and they actually care suddenly. And it was totally accidental that we came on this. Um, so like I alluded to earlier, I don't really come from a very well-off background, and I feel like education and academia have totally changed my life. And I, so I spend a lot of time trying to reach out to uh, kids in poorer neighborhoods to try and get them interested in, in STEM. And when we just, my, my friend Tim Verstein and I, uh, we, we were hanging out in grad school drinking beers and what happens when you get a bunch of neuroscience PhD students drinking beers uh, doing movie nights together is it turns out they try and figure out why does a zombie why can't a zombie coordinate their movements why don't they speak well it's probably Wernicke's and Broca's aphasia right and so this is what happens this is just what happens and we started we started breaking down all of the different zombie symptoms why they're hyper aggressive why why can't they you know um, why, why don't they eat each other why do they only need people? And we're trying to figure out, like, okay, what are the neurological bases for all these things? And when we, when we started going and talking to students and, and bringing this stuff up, it worked. It clicked. And this neuroscience conference that I was telling you about, um, so it may not be coming across up here properly, but uh, I'm, I've been told I'm kind of a jackass. So uh, when I was a first-year PhD student uh, at, at Berkeley, finishing up my neuroscience, or starting my neuroscience PhD, uh, Berkeley does a retreat every year for the neuroscientists. They go up to Lake Tahoe, and they go up for a weekend and they have all these scientific talks from all the different professors. And uh, there's a poster session where all the new neuroscience students can show off their research. And I didn't have one. But the, the weekend or the day before that we got up there, the United States Geological Survey, the USGS, had just had their retreat at the exact same location. And somebody from their session didn't take down their poster on drilling Arctic core samples to try and look at the change in you know, carbon emissions over time or whatever. And I stood next to that thing as though it was my neuroscience poster. And I was arguing that we were trying to study the, uh, the effects of uh, ultra-cold temperatures on brain function. And to do this, we, we shipped a fMRI scanner 
down to Antarctica and we buried it under the ice and had people laying in the ice while freezing uh, <laughs> to study their brain function. People are like, oh my God, really? And I was like, yeah. And you know, at one point the drill broke down so we had to actually start getting down and dig by hand. And my eventual PhD advisor and the head of the department are standing there and everybody's drinking wine and looking at this and they're like, what the hell are you doing? And I'm like, I can't believe they're buying it for this long. This is amazing. And and so that sort of precipitated this whole idea of, well, we, we actually hung a poster about the zombie brain up at this Society for Neuroscience conference. And we tweeted it out and we said, you have to check out this amazing research, go over to this poster. And it sort of caught on and, went, and people were like, you have to check out this Nobel Prize winning research by Wojtek and Versteinen, this is amazing. And so like we had people just descending on this. And for me, the moment where this kind of jackassery clicked into this might be useful was there is a security guard working at the conference. And I've been going to this conference for 13 years. And never does anybody working at this conference center actually stop and read these stupid esoteric posters. And the security guard, I have a picture of this guy just standing there. And he's like looking at the poster and they eventually brought over their friends. It's like, it was amazing that the people who were working at the thing were suddenly engaged with the topic at hand. And so that's how it started. We wrote a couple of blog posts and it just like totally went viral. Wired picked it up and like, uh, you know, uh, very amusingly to me, so Comic-Con every year here in San Diego, I've been going for like 27 years or something since it was like, yeah, since it was like 350 people that were going to this thing and you can get in on the day of, right? Now it's like 120,000 people. And so I've been going since I was a kid. And to me, it's amazing that I never thought I would have anything to do with comics, but I've actually given a talk now at Comic-Con with Max Brooks, uh, who did, uh, he wrote the book World War Z, which became the movie. He's Mel Brooks's son. Um, we've been on panels for the last couple of years together talking about zombies. And I've given a talk at Comic-Con at the convention center. The neuroscience conference is held at UC, uh, at in San Diego once every three years. It rotates between cities. I've given a neuroscience talk in that exact same room, which to me is really weird to have gotten up in front of, in front of a bunch of people dressed as like, you know, uh, stormtroopers talking about zombie brains. And then three months later, getting up in front of a whole group of very serious neuroscientists talking about actual research. It's so weird, but it worked. and. Um, we were asked to write a book by Princeton University Press. They approached us at this conference and said, this is awesome, we'd love for you to guide. And it's essentially, we wrote it as an intro to neuroscience textbook, just with the, the zombie hook. And it's amazing how well that has caught on. I mean, like 10 people bought the book, but uh, it's actually like, it's been popular <laughs> in terms of people think the idea is fun. <laughs> Very cool, I look forward to reading it. All right, so at this point, we're gonna open it up to your questions. Very importantly, I'm gonna pass the microphone. Please speak into the microphone because the whole thing is recorded, in case you didn't know, is being videotaped and is gonna go onto our YouTube channel. And you know what drives people crazy when they watch those videos? When they can't hear the questions. They can only hear the answers. So please make sure we speak in the microphone, please. So I've been working on a migraine diet book, and I'm, I'm very interested in what you guys have learned about migraine and whatever you can tell me generally that maybe your meta-analysis has found. And also, um, I think they, it's also interesting to see the, the non-invasive, because my, my argument is take the drugs if you need them, but that's not a long-term solution. So it's kind of paralleling what you're talking about. But I'd love to hear what, if anything, you guys have learned more specifically about migraine. Well, so regarding the second point, right, the most effective treatment for a lot of disorders is not just medication, but medication and therapy, right? Combined, it's incredibly effective, right? The whole idea behind medication is to stabilize somebody to a point where therapy then is helpful. Um, and that's probably, <laughs> this is Cal, you, Berkeley, probably calling me to solicit money donations. Uh, they call almost every night right around this time. So um, in terms of my, I actually don't know a lot about migraines and that's one of the frustrating things about this is there's a lot of really interesting hypotheses that fell out of this paper or this, this analysis tool, but I'm not a specialist. I don't know much about migraines at all. Um, and so I don't even know if there's any legitimacy to this, right? We tried to validate some of the ideas that came out through expert knowledge. But at the end of the day, right, the proof is, does it, do you learn something new? Uh, and we don't, we don't run those experiments. We can't. We don't have the money, the time, et cetera. Um, we don't have the person power to do it. So I don't really know. Migraines are so, they're understudied, incredibly understudied. Um, uh, like almost, almost comically, the NIH is like finally starting to try and put some uh, money into doing so. But, you know, we, we know 
I have very strong effects. I, I can't even imagine. I, I, I hate headaches, like, and I'm also about that. I can't even imagine what a migraine must feel like, um, let alone cluster headaches and things like that, right? Um, so I don't really have much to say, unfortunately, about migraine specifically. Uh, it's slow research because there isn't a lot of funding for it, though. Hi, I'm Mark. Um, there's one thing, well, there's like three things that are amazing that you were talking about that I just wanted maybe you to comment on. One was the SSRIs. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's been some correlation now between uh, a lot of crazy people on the streets that are, especially shooters in particular, I hate to say that, but that had been on SSRIs. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering, you know, you're saying those things, they work and they help, but they don't know exactly which area of the mind, the brain it's targeting. And, and I guess all of that could lead to some kind of depression that would create people to do whatever they do. The other thing was acquired savant syndrome, which um, is like a, um, an autistic child or a savant who can hear a piano concerto and then turn around and play it uh, two minutes later, note for note, exact, again and again, and oftentimes never had heard that song before. That's kind of the same area of the brain that you're working with or juggling ideas on. And then one more um, on uh, REM sleep or systematic self desensitization or, or uh, de uh, desensitization tanks where you, you know, go into that, I don't want to say dark, dark area, not, not a dark area of the mind, but an unknown area of the mind in which you can become very productive, very uh, succinct, very thought-provoking I don't know anything about the latter I, I just I don't know anything about it um, but a couple of points so one the same area of the brain this is like a classic thing this drives me nuts as a neuroscientist um, so the example I like to use is like the same the same body part that I use well I'm not but like that we use maybe to sing an opera is also the same one we vomit from but that doesn't mean that they're related <laughs> Right? And this is true for the brain too. The brain is very heavily interconnected and overlapping. It turns out that like the visual part of the brain, the visual cortex, it's not actually visual. It doesn't have to be. It's only visual if you have sight. If you're congenitally blind, then it becomes a touch area of the brain. It responds to braille. So brain region specificity, we do know that there are brain regions that are highly related to certain things. And if it's damaged, then you can't do certain behaviors anymore. This is actually classically how we know pretty much anything about brain region specificity, but they don't have to be, is your argument. There's a whole fascinating field of neural reuse, it's called, which is how different neurons in different brain regions can be reused to do multiple different things. It's a major, major hot area of research right now. Um, with regard to acquired savant syndrome, all I, all I can do is appeal to uh, somebody who is more intelligent and a better writer than I, uh, Oliver Sacks, who recently passed away. He is a brilliant, beautiful writer. He was a medical doctor neurologist who saw m tens of thousands of patients over the course of his practice. And he wrote beautifully about them. Uh, the Man Who Mistook His Wife for Hat, Anthropologist on Mars, amazing books, What Got Me Into the Field. And he talks about some of these acquired savantism and things like this. The last one is about uh, SSRIs and the like mass shootings. In the entire history of the United States, it going back, or I should say, in the last 60 years where mass shootings have, become, have been a thing, also every single one except for one of the hundreds of them have been men. Right? So you can't, like, make, drawing these conclusions about, like, well, they also were some, were, some were also on SSRIs. A lot of Americans are on SSRIs. Millions of Americans are on SSRIs, we're not, and they're not going around shooting people. Right? So saying that it's an SSRI, th I think that's, like, a, that's a very... The, we have a very strange view in our culture of mental illness. Any mental illness is potentially dangerous. Schizophrenia, schizophrenia, schizophrenics, they are dangerous people. That is the view we have as a culture, and it is just not true. Uh, this relationship between this, that we conflate mental illness with psychopathy. And, uh, you know, there's, uh, uh, I, this is now anecdotal, but the, the only thing I've heard about why that may be is Reagan's policies in the 80s of turning out everybody from uh, you know actual mental health institutes and closing those down and turning them out on the street, is that these were people who were severely institutionalized, like they had severe illness, and then they're the ones who became homeless. And so like the idea is that that may be the, the genesis of this idea. But there are m 
hundreds of thousands and millions of Americans that suffer that don't suffer from schizophrenia, I should say. They have it, they're diagnosed with it, but they don't suffer, right? They're not psychopathic. They're just, they have a thing. Let me, uh, let me ask you two more quick ideas <coughs> that I think are seriously related. And one was uh, neuro-linguistic programming, which I think, I, l I love what you said, and everybody should certainly take advantage of that if you believe in metaphysics or use metaphysics. You know, what you think is what you get, so change the way you think. And you said, you know, replace the, I'm paraphrasing, trying to paraphrase, you said replace the negative thought or the depression thought with the active progressive thought. That's neuro-linguistic programming, and so is, uh, you know, uh, meditation or treatment or metaphysics. Um, so how close do you think it is to neuro-linguistic programming? Is that a shortcut to mo behavior modification? Yeah, neuro-linguistic programming, that's a really, so that is generally considered to be discredited in, the neuro, in like neuroscience, right? And, and the evidence that you can use language to affect behavior in a controlled kind of way, in some sense is not really well borne out in scientific findings. But on the flip side, obviously, so this is my favorite example, don't think of a pink elephant. Everybody's now visualizing that thing. We can put you in a scanner. Your visual cortex is active right now because you're visualizing a pink elephant. There's a professor at uh, UCSD in my department, Ben Bergen, uh, and he studies the way that language affects the way that we think, metaphors, the way that we our, our brains work. And it turns out that we know for a fact that if you, if I say a word, a part of your brain called Wernicke's area becomes active. That is the word comprehension area. If that part of the brain is damaged, you can no longer comprehend speech or language at all, actually. We know that. But also, what's funky and what's really weird is that when you see an elephant, the visual cortex in the back, the neurons that represent the, the photons that are coming into your eye, those become active at the side of an elephant. If you imagine seeing an elephant, those same neurons become active in similar patterns. In auditory cortex, it's very clear. Uh, there's actually uh, my PhD thesis advisor, Robert Knight up at Berkeley. They did a study a couple years ago where they, they uh, used these recordings in people of the auditory cortex and had them listen to sounds and they could reconstruct what the people were hearing based upon the patterns of brain activity. They took it a step further and they had the people imagine sentences. And based upon the pattern of uh, activity in the auditory cortex, they were also able to reconstruct better than chance what they were thinking about saying without actually saying it. So we do know that words and language and visualization do have an actual effect and we can even decode that information. Um, and they're using this for people who have something called locked-in syndrome, very rare disorder, a beautiful book again, uh, a movie called The Diving Bell and the Butterfly written by somebody with locked-in syndrome. Locked-in syndrome is where you cannot move any muscle in your body. You're fully conscious and awake and aware of those surroundings but you cannot move. It's incredibly rare. It doesn't really happen very often. And the only reason we know that they're conscious and awake and aware is that there's one case of this one person who wrote the book who they could still manage to twitch an eye a little bit. And his girlfriend or wife noticed that he would twitch an eye every now and then when she said stuff. And she, she I think, gave a board with letters on it and would point to one letter at a time and he would twitch an eye when she got to the letter that he was pointing at and that's how they wrote the book. And so the idea here is that can instead of having to do this laborious thing, can you put these recording electrodes over the neurons in the auditory cortex and have them imagine talking and output that through a computer and have them actually be able to have a voice? So that's what they're working on. So how close are we to reading uh, thoughts? Uh, you can only do this with brain surgery. So, oh, sorry, the question was how close are we to reading thoughts? So. Uh, <laughs> this is going to sound very silly, but the skull is a problem <laughs> for neuroscientists. <laughs> the skull is really annoying. It gets in the way of a lot of interesting stuff. So uh, if we want to record the electrical activity of the brain, uh, we can use these recording electrodes, EEG, on, on the head, and we can get a gist. But the problem is it would be like trying to figure out, uh, you know, you go to a domed football stadium and you've got a microphone outside the dome. You can hear when everybody's cheering, but you don't know if it's because like Gronk caught a, caught a pass or what happened, right? You have no idea what caused that cheering. All you know is that people are cheering. That's pretty much what, what uh, brain imaging is like with EEG. You know that something happened, but you don't know what or where. And in, in contrast, you have something like fMRI, functional magnetic resonance imaging. We know exactly where in the brain something happened. Technically, it actually doesn't measure neuron activity. It measures blood oxygenation, which is a pretty good surrogate for brain activity, but not really. 
So all those brain scans that you see of like the pretty pictures of brain activity, that's because it's 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 using fMRI, which is iffy. I don't use it because uh, I'm not a big fan. But um, we know where in the brain something happened, but we have no idea when because this blood oxygenation response happens seconds after the actual neurons communicated and fired. And there's a lot of variability. So we don't know when, you can either know where something is happening with fMRI or when something happened with EEG, but you can't know both. There's no way to non-invasively know both. It is actually mathematically a true truism. You cannot know both. It's sort of like Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, but for the brain, right? And that just has to do with the fact that we cannot get around the fact that the skull smooths out this information. The only way we can sort of is with what's called MEG, which is magnetoencephalography. So the skull has like living tissue and the electrical activity of the neurons hits that living tissue and smooths it out and smears all over the place. And you can't, you can't reverse and, and, and mathematically figure out where that signal came from. With MEG, you can, but the problem with MEG is the only way it can actually work is with what are called squids, super, super conducting quantum interference detectors. And those aren't really very mobile. <laughs> you, need, you need helium super cooled uh, little, little sensors in order, and somebody has to sit very still in order to do it. Because magnetism doesn't get absorbed by the skull. So you can record some of these magnetic things, but that's about it. So when can we read the brain from afar? It's not going to happen. I, 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 mean, I legitimately think it cannot happen. Um, but if you are willing to get a brain implant, Wow, we can do some of that now. Hi, my name is Rob. Uh, this actually is kind of related to the skull being an issue. Uh, so you talked about these this therapy where they implant some kind of thing deep inside the brain and stimulate certain areas. Recently on some NPR or radio lab program, I heard about transcranial direct current stimulation. Is that related? Is that hocus pocus? Can you speak no, to that? It's not hocus pocus. So TDCS, transcranial direct current stimulation, is a very fancy way of saying a nine volt battery hooked up to some sponges, essentially. Um, so I've used TDCS. I haven't been able to get any reliable research effects on it. So I think there's some publication biases at play. But it actually, it's kind of, I've written about this. There's a company called Focus, F O C dot US. I actually, I don't even want to say their name. I just said it. I don't want to give them publicity. They're trying to sell these at home TDCS devices. Yeah. And I think that's kind of dangerous. So I liken it to um, Queen Victoria was a big fan of cocaine infused wine. There used to be wines that were, were, were cocaine infused. Cocaine was, uh, you know, over the counter. Heroin was also an overcount of the medication, right? We could have a whole conversation about addiction and heroin. Turns out heroin's not really that addictive. Uh, I think people think it is, but it's really not. Uh, you can use heroin and not get addicted. Most people don't get addicted. It's incredibly hard to get addicted to these kind of things. But anyway, that's an aside. So cocaine infused wine was something that was endorsed by Queen Victoria herself, right? Um, and it was, you know, oh, you know, aided in digestion and uh, attention and focus and all these kinds of things. I think we're now in the electroceutical equivalent of cocaine-infused wine, right? You have, oh, TDCS, it'll help your attention, it'll help all these kinds of things. And it kind of sort of does in very controlled research conditions with very specific definitions of attention uh, in a research environment, uh, when in reality, eh, and it, so again, the skull smooths out electrical signals. That's just a property of the skull and the skull tissues. TDCS devices, what it does is you've got essentially a battery. Um, and the simplest device is like a nine volt battery with some alligator clamps and you clamp those onto sponges that are soaked in saline. And the sponges are like this. And you just pass a current. Yeah. And you have, you have the uh, anode and the cathode and the current runs through. Most of it gets smeared out by the skull, but it passes through. Um, and so if you have it here and here, then it'll pass across like the frontal lobe, for example. It's very weak. Um, and this is actually touching on my research, which is very weak electrical fields actually do bias the, the way that neurons fire, the way that neurons send action potentials. So from a, physi <coughs> Excuse me. from a physiological standpoint, it totally makes sense. But the problem is it's like a sledgehammer. It's, n it's a very blunt uh, instrument. It's not at all focused. Um, there's a, there's a, uh, a company uh, that sells a device called Think, T U I. T-H-Y-N-C, which is also an at-home TDCS. That's funded by uh, Vinod Kosla um, uh, of Kosla Ventures, sort of co-founder of Sun Microsystems. They also are funding a project where they have this device to try and use ultrasound 
to stimulate brain regions. So this is actually, we talked about this at lunch. There's a surgical technique in brain surgery called a gamma knife uh, using, uh, I think it's actually gamma radiation. And the way that it works is you have, you have uh, let's just, for simplicity's sake, let's say a laser. And you have it pointed this way through somebody's head and you shoot it right through. And the energy that that radio, that, that radiation energy, the radio waves pass straight through, doesn't do anything at all to any of the brain tissue, passes right through, no problem. You have another one going in this direction. And where they cross, they have constructive interference. So they, they like A and B, right? One and two add up. And that addition creates just enough energy to, in this case for the gamma knife surgery, burn out the brain region that needs to be removed, like burn out the, the cancer. Uh, it's a credible surgery. So it's non-invasive brain surgery. And this, this idea of uh, th this company that they're funding uh, is using ultrasound to the same effect. But instead of burning out the brain region, it just provides just enough energy to the neurons in that brain region where they overlap to cause them to fire action potentials. So how do you apply currents in your research? You mentioned you have some research where you apply low currents to different sections of the brain. How do you apply it in your... Well, so we, use, we, we have used TDCS, but we use it for a different thing. So the, the logical flow and a lot of the studies is this prefrontal cortex we know is very important up here, this part of the brain up here, for working memory. In order for you to be able to remember a list of, uh, you know, in order for you to remember your grocery list, nobody actually has to do that anymore because we have like iPhones and crap, but like, it, you know, when you had to remember stuff, um, your prefrontal cortex is, is very much responsible. This is my PhD research. Of if that part of the brain is missing, how does that affect the way that information f reroutes around the brain to allow you to still remember things? If that part's gone, you have a harder time remembering things. If we stimulate that brain area with TDCS, maybe we'll have an easier time remembering things. That is a logic, and that's a very weird logic because that's not the way the brain works. It's like, oh, well, you know, my Mac uh, laptop, it works off of 110 volt electricity, uh, you know, coming in from, from my power lines. What if I put 200 volts of electricity into it? <laughs> I bet that'll make it work better. Turns out you don't want to do that. That doesn't work that way. But it's the same kind of logic. So what we do when we've used it is we use it to try and say, well, uh, what we're doing essentially is making it easier for neurons to fire when they shouldn't be. So we're adding noise to the system. So we should be able to decrease certain kinds of behaviors. So we should actually make them worse. So that's kind of the way that we've used it in my lab. Okay. Is, as we study, one of the things I study is the, the, the effect that neural noise, when neurons fire when they shouldn't be. First of all, how do you quantify when they shouldn't be? That's hard. Um, but then once you sort of come up with some measures of that, how does that affect the way that information flows around the brain? That's, that's part of the research that we do in my lab. Thank you. Um, I have two questions. One is, uh, where are the areas that are ripe for discovery and uh, diving deep into data? You, you mm -hmm. talked about that just a little bit, that are sort of unexplored. And the second is, what are we doing right and wrong right now with children who have learning disabilities? What are we doing right or wrong? Oh, man. I think wrong, we're probably over-interpreting small sampled studies um, and then trying to pass those along as though they are uh, fact. So one of my favorite statistics is that um, something like, n I think it's 96% of peer-reviewed publications using human subjects. So if you see a paper and it's like, red meat, contain red meat causes cancer. Uh, you know, if you teach kids uh, math problems by age three, then they have better math outcomes by age seven. 96% of those studies are done in what are called weird populations, which is Western educated industrialized rich democracies. So we have a heavy, heavy bias in our sampling as scientists. And we're trying to say that if I run a research study as a, as a neuroscientist at UCSD, uh, I will have 15 people in my study and I'll publish a paper on them. That, that's considered a legitimate N of population size. That is 15 San Diegans <laughs> who are between the age of 18 and 22. And I'm trying to say, we have figured out how memory works in the brain. No, we figured out how memory might kind of work, statistically speaking, slightly above chance. In those 15, you know, uh, half, half of them white, half of them Asian kids from San Diego who are between this age and this age, right? So I think that's where we're going wrong, is we're over-interpreting uh, very small study sample sizes, which then feeds directly into your next question, which is how can data help? Bigger data, right? So essentially when I go to a doctor and I say, you know, I have a thing, I have a, I have a rash, I don't know, whatever, right? Who knows, right? Um, I don't wanna know 
should I take this ointment or this ointment? Like, what is the outcome? I want to know for a male who's about 35 years old, who has a mixed Native American and uh, Italian heritage, what is the right thing for me to be doing, right? It's so crazy to me that we give the same, like, same drugs to men and women, even, right? I mean, uh, you know, so let's say binary gender, we'll, we'll simplify it here, right? Which I clearly am, it's not, but we'll simplify and say there's binary gender. Why are we giving the same drugs? They have very, very, we have, we just are different biologically, obviously, it turns out. If you just, you know, look, you'll, like, there is very different biology, <laughs> right? Um, why are we giving that, like, we're treating everybody as a homogeneous thing, and we're not, which isn't to say that that's, like, somehow detracts from anything. It just means that we can be doing better in the way that we treat people, right? And that's, like, kind of the personalized medicine, which, gets really tricky. I don't know if like genomics or like personalized genomics and any of that really is going to help. It's got to in some way, I think, but I, I, then I'm done. I don't know anything more. I know you now know all the things I know. <laughs> Hot uh, I presentation. Victor, Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, really enjoyed it. Uh, the use of the zombies is very intelligent. <laughs> but what can the Internet of uh, Things and silent intelligence do for expanding your research? Uh, could you find better technology than sponges and low voltage? The Internet of Things. So I, I okay. So uh, to try and avoid being one trick pony, we've thought about what can we do other than zombies, right? And so we thought about what about like. Okay, I'm going to be honest here. If I write a grant to the NIH, which I am, I do, I say, I am interested in this phenomena because it has very strong implications in our understanding of the way that very basic neural mechanisms work and it has implications in disorders that are very common, like depression and anxiety and so on. Really what I want to be writing is, holy shit, the brain is amazing. Can you believe the things that we've figured out? What if the matrix could be real? What if I could upload Kung Fu? That would be, we are close. What if, that's what I want to be writing. I can't write that, right? Um, but that's one of the fun things about taking this other personality and this kind of zombie research is we, we've started talking about, uh, we, we did another poster a couple years back of uh, before the Robocop remake came out and said, what if, what if we could just build a Robocop today given today's technology, right? Versus the 1987-ish Robocop. We have GPS. What if you can embed GPS in Robocop? Auto aiming. We could stimulate his muscles to move the gun exactly at the right place at the exact right time. When we started doing that, we're like, wow, this is kind of messed up. Like, what if we, we actually, these are all plausible things that we could do. We should stop talking about this. This is kind of concerning. Um, <laughs> because I can use something called TMS, which is more focused. So transcranial magnetic stimulation as opposed to direct current magnetism passes through the skull, you give me 35 seconds with your brain and a TMS device and I can make you twitch this finger versus this one versus this one. No problem, right? And if you just TMS in just the right pattern, I can make you do this versus this versus, I can't actually do that because we don't have those devices, but if I could, if, if one were willing to do so, that's, that's kind of trivially easy to do. Um, and so, we, we, but we've talked about like what, what non-dangerous, societally dangerous ideas could we do given given modern neuroscience and I was like well what if we had you guys watch Big Hero 6 Big Hero 6 was actually pretty cool I, I really enjoyed that I saw that movie with my son when he was like two and a half and it was so I have a sort of soft spot for that movie now because it was like our first movie together but um, the whole idea of if you're not familiar with it there is a device that this kid creates using microbots and there's these little magnetic robots that have very simple behaviors and he controls them using this device, which is essentially EEG. So using his thoughts, he's able to control where all these little microbots go. And I'm like, we can actually right now use, a, use an EEG system that you can buy at home, like a Muse headset, and probably control drones flying. <laughs> like, that's actually something we could do. I could hook up your EEG to a drone, and you can sit there and think and fly a drone. We could probably just make that. Now, that doesn't really have much scientific value, but it has a lot of selling science value and getting getting students interested in science. And so there's this weird relationship we as a culture have of um, people who are science popularizers aren't, like they're, it's like we, we like them, but they're also kind of frowned upon because they're not doing real science. Any time away, spent away from not doing serious science is, is, is somehow bad. And I am, I, am, I am so against that. I think it is our, one of our jobs as scientists isn't, doesn't have to be, but it can be should we decide to make it so to in order to communicate and sort of share that amazing that sense of wonder right so th I think that's how it would work 
Hi, I'm Steve Vensicle. I'm pretty new here to San Diego and stuff. And, and Me too. Uh, I don't think I'm even really intelligent enough to be sitting in this room. <laughs> it seems like there's a <laughs> lot of brain power in here. Um, I'm a, a, you know, ex-corporate employee, uh, so uh, a lot of my patterning has been uh, thinking a certain way and stuff, but I've recently become an entrepreneur, and I just would like to know, talking about the, the EEG machines, um, I've seen things like the Emotive Epoch out on the market and stuff. Uh, how close are we to getting to somewhere where it's like a uh, hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy where I can put this uh, emotive e epoch on my head and I can print out a pizza to a 3D printer? Because that's all I really want to do in life. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good question. Can we do that? Yeah, we could probably figure out a way to do that. Um, so, okay, I have to say uh, the EG signals, the actual neural signals that we can pick up uh, without getting under your skull, are incredibly weak. So your laptop, 110 microvolt is what the, uh, 110 volts is what the US power supply runs on. That's what comes into your house. The signal that we pick up on uh, the scalp is, if it's a really strong one, about five to 10 microvolts. So about 110 millionth of the power coming into your laptop, which gives you a little bit of a zap if you touch your outlet, right? If it's not gonna kill you, but it gives you a little bit of a zap. So, one ten millionth or so of that is about what we can pick up on, on your skull. Now your eye, your retina, the very thing in the back of your eye, those neurons, they have an electrical charge too. When you blink, your eyes roll into the back of your head. And when you move your eyes, if I, we call it make a saccade, if I dart my eyes over there and then over there, and I have an EEG system on my head, the electrical charge from your eyeball is about an order or two magnitude higher than what we can pick up from your, your brain cells. Right, so something like a home system of like the epoch and emotive, all of those electrodes are sitting right here on your forehead. If you if you actually just go to your ear and move about two to three inches up and just sort of press right here, everybody just try this really quick and bite down. Do you feel that? That's called your masseter muscle. That's huge. The way that that muscle is moving and the way that all your muscles move is that the brain sends a signal down to the, the, the spinal cord or brain stem and that electrically sends a signal out to your muscles and the muscles get an electrical impulse that causes them to contract. That signal from the muscles, order of magnitude or two higher than the brain signals. So it turns out, if somebody's sitting there and you're trying to have them concentrate, what do you do when you concentrate? That furrowing of your brow is probably what a lot of these systems are picking up. It has nothing to do with your actual brain activity. When you're trying to concentrate and the emotive lets you like move a thing up or down, it's probably picking up these muscle activity because you go mm. And it turns out, the harder the thing, this is a major problem in neuroscience research, the harder the task, the more you furrow your brow on average. And so you can get what looks like very strong frontal brain activity in response to uh, attention or memory load, but you're picking up muscle activity because you're furrowing your brow harder when the task is harder. So that's a big problem. Now, if you don't care where the signal comes from and you just want to use your eyes, great, that's a wonderful signal. The signal with noise is fantastic. If you want to print a pizza by going, I rotate my, eyes, count, uh, I rotate my eyes clockwise three and a half times, perfect, we can print you a pizza. That's a really easy signal. Now, if you want it to actually be the pizza part of your brain doing the signaling, that's not gonna happen. <laughs> I got one more quick one. Uh, on um, if, if you're speculating that we, or well, what, what do you speculate we might be using in terms of our mental equivalent, if it's like 3%, uh, 8%, 20%, and then you know we've grown exponentially from in the last 60 years, what do you, what does your imagination tell you we might, where we might go or uh, uh, to, towards telepathy, precognition? Okay, I, I have to say, we, we, that, like, we use 10% of our brains thing, that's a myth, right? It turns out we have a phrase in neuroscience, fire together, wire together which is in order for a neuron, all neurons are trying to commit suicide. That's a, that's a fact. All of your brain cells are trying to die. In order for them to keep, in order to keep themselves from committing suicide, we call it apoptosis, they have to be getting constant signaling. They have to get some inputs from other neurons. They have to be being used. The brain doesn't, the body doesn't like waste. Your, your, your brain is about two to 3% of your overall body mass, but it gets 20% of the output from your heart. We are, the brain is really, really expensive. And evolutionarily, they have been optimized to not have much waste. So we, are, we never use 100% of your brains at any given time because if that were true, you'd be having a seizure. 
Like the, we, we can't be using all of the brain all the time or else the, there is no communication happening. Everything is just yelling all at once. In order for us to have effective communication between brain regions, in order for us to behave, you have to be having certain things not doing stuff, actively not doing stuff. We have two classes of brain cells, broadly speaking. We have excitation and inhibition. There's a whole class, about 20% of the neurons in your brain, their whole job is to shut other brain cells up. When they fire action potentials, that's causing other brain cells to not do anything. That's a critical part of the way that our brains function is by shutting down brain activity. So the world may be getting more complex, um, but I'm not necessarily, the, the time scale over which that has happened over the last 100 years in terms of evolution is nothing. So we still have our like barely out of Neanderthal brains, right? Dealing with the modern world. Now that doesn't mean that like we, 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 we adapt, right? We are very adaptable. It's one of the amazing things about the brain, right? I no longer have to remember stuff. That's what this is for. That's my, I call, I call this is called cerebellum. This is my little brain, <laughs> right? This is like, I don't have to remember things, which drives my wife nuts because she'll like, I told you this last week. Well, uh, you know, is it my calendar? I don't know. Um, so we are, we are sort of adapting, uh, you know, whether or not uh, <laughs> personal relationships survive that adaptation. But uh, we, 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 are, we are tapped out <laughs> already, I think. Well, I think we have time for one last question. Uh, hi, my name's Nathan. I have three questions. The third one's more of a joke, but um, I'll start with uh, the first one. Which languages do you prefer to write your data analysis in? Python. Nice. Uh, what what did what are you most excited about in the next um, in the field of neurosciences? See in your lifetime. Python. <laughs> <laughs> Wait. So, okay. What am I most excited about? Yeah. Uh, that's actually only a half. That's only a half joking answer. Um, what am I most excited about? I am excited about data sharing. So that's actually that's why Python is only half of a joke. Um, but do your third one, and then we'll come back to that. Uh, which side of Rocco's Basilisk are you on? What is that? Which side of Rocco's Basilisk are you on? I don't know what on? that is. What is that? <laughs> uh, Rocco's Basilisk is a thought experiment where either you're helping to build the singularity or you're against it. Oh. And uh, the singularity will uh, punish you in the future when it, it will happens. will punish me? <laughs> if you're against it, if you're for I it. I, I would like to think that if I am a good person and I, I live my life well, that God will reward me in heaven. I mean, the singularity will see what I have done. There's not a much of a difference there, actually. So let's just say that. Um, okay, so what am I most excited about? So data sharing really is a part of it. So uh, data, a lot of data are lost. A lot of data in the sciences are just gone. Some poor graduate student, they get suckered into jo doing a PhD, uh, for like, you know, $20,000 a year, and they go in and they, they slave away for five years in a lab, and they collect a bunch of data, and it sits on their hard drive, and they maybe, if they're lucky, get a paper or two out of it, and then it just goes away. And there is a big push now for, I, I'm a big open science advocate. So we have, in our lab, everything goes up on GitHub. Whenever we publish a paper, you can, ideally, we haven't, we haven't done this quite yet, uh, but my postdoc and I are meeting tomorrow to finish up our, our first one, which is, the entire thing will be in a Python Jupyter notebook, which is you can see the entire text of our paper, and you can also see all of the code that is used to generate all of the statistics and all of the figures. So you can reproduce our experiment in this one document from start to finish. And so once all of those data are up there and being shared, uh, the kinds of experiments that you can then do are, are tremendous. So the example I like to give is one of the biggest breakthroughs in neuroscience in the last couple of years is something called optogenetics. If people don't know this phrase, opto meaning uh, visual, right, light. Genetics meaning, I mean, people kind of know genetics. And what they do is they knock in, we say a gene, so you genetically modify a rat so that a very specific class of neurons express a protein. That protein is sensitive to a very specific color of light. And if they shine a laser at that frequency of that light onto that neuron, they can make that neuron turn on or turn off. Where that, I, like, where that came from is by people studying algae. People were wondering, why do, wh how do algae phosphoresce? Why do some algae glow? And they discovered this protein. Kind of a boring, nobody gives a crap about algae and why they glow. Nobody cares, that's just like a boring finding wait a minute, 
what if we could take that gene that encodes for that protein that allows them to glow? What if we put that in neurons and use lasers? Like, so there's this tremendous ecosystem that can be built where you can take what are seemingly innocuous data, seemingly, seemingly innocuous findings, they're like, why are we as a culture funding that? I don't give a damn about algae. Why am I paying somebody to study algae? Oh, it turns out 10 years later, you're gonna use that to cure Alzheimer's, right? So this optogenetics that came from a stupid study on algae, right? This is like the argument for why do we do basic science? I find it amazing that we live in a culture that gives me a job. We as a culture say, you, we'll give you money, think of stuff, right? They're like we shit on, our, shit on America a lot for being anti-science, but I still have a job and a lot of us do. So even though there's all this push and pull and back and forth, this job still exists and we as a culture still find that valuable. That's amazing to me. What else can we do is we start sharing not just protocols and findings, but data, the raw data, right? If you had every brain scan that's ever been done on every person, in a database from the last 30 years, you could study the effects that climate change, temperature, city, whatever. You could study suddenly all these different things over time, but how do these different factors in society affect brain functioning, right? If that data existed, I, you could run experiments I couldn't even think of right now, right? But we throw it away. But we're finally getting to a point where we're not. And so to me, what's most exciting is the fact that the culture of science is changing, that people want to start sharing not only the methods, which is what peer review is about, but also the raw data. All right. Well, at this point of time, I wanted to thank Brad. I'm personally always fascinated by those conversations. I look forward thank to you. talking more. But thanks a lot for coming. Um, I want to thank all of you for coming tonight. Hope you enjoyed this. Hope you are going to sign up for our other events. Uh, please spread the word. Uh, please tell others about what we're doing, about our events. Come to our other events. We always look forward to seeing you next time. We're probably going to have a social event somewhere right around Thanksgiving, and we're going to have another panel in December. But you'll learn more from our meetup page. Also wanted to thank uh, people who helped a lot to put this event together. wanted to thank Chris Screenak, who's been doing video recording. Uh, Chris is uh, doing work for GoPro right now. And uh, if you haven't figured out, we have something like five cameras filming what's going on here from different angles. It's all going to be turned into a video. It's going to be on our YouTube channel, The Silent Intelligence. Uh, also wanted to thank Taylor Gaines and Julie Kendick for making this event possible. Thanks a lot, guys. All right. Thank you. The Silent Intelligence. Learn more at www dot the silent intelligence dot com